Hi everyone, Pirag Juthani, internal medicine resident, and today I'm going to show you how to think like a doctor. This is very interesting because a lot of my videos are about medical education, but I feel like so many times I don't get a chance to physically show you the types of things that resident physicians go through. And so if you're a medical student, if you're an early intern, or even if you're just someone applying to medical school, I want to show you today what it's like to go through a real patient case. And in the process, I want to show you that there's two sides of this. That's why I have this photo here. There's one part where I'm really thinking like what's going on, but then there's another part where you often have to create like a mental map and often it can be very confusing and you have to uh, kind of distinguish between these things. So the goal of this video is that I'm going to walk you through a patient case um, and by doing this I'm going to show you the nuances of how you can truly learn to think like a doctor. Uh, this is something that I go through every day. By no means am I even remotely that great at it, but I try my best and as I've kind of refined my skills, I think there's a lot that can be learned. Uh, of course, this is an entirely fictional patient case, and it's also not meant to overwhelm you, but just to show you the connections between your pre-medical studies, medical school, and early residency. So here is the summary of the case. This is a 53-year-old gentleman uh, who is a direct admit to your hospital. That means they often just came in, uh, they've been admitted, they were admitted two days ago, and they actually presented to an outside hospital with fatigue, weight loss, and self-reported fevers at home. They were found to newly have AML, and they're here for their induction chemotherapy. You may not know what any of this means, and that's totally fine. They have a single lumen pick, which means they have a peripherally inserted central catheter, which usually means it goes all the way through their right atrium, or at least the top part of the right atrium, the vena cava, which allows us to get blood, and that's often where the chemo goes from. Um, and then this is the history leading up to the patient's admission. About three to four months ago, the patient noted that he was starting to get more fatigued, wife noted that his energy was down, and over that time he lost 10 kilograms and also started having some night sweats. Wife brought him into his local VA in Chico and he was diagnosed with AML. So he was diagnosed in Chico and now he's here for what's known as induction chemotherapy. I'm gonna walk you through all the things that are gonna happen to this patient through this case and it may be very overwhelming. Just know that this is a case that actually some of my resident colleagues and I created as a simulation. So we'll walk you through actively what's going on. Um, some things that I see right off the bat is the age, right? You always want to think about a patient's age. You also want to think about what is they, what are they here for? They're starting induction chemotherapy. AML is a very, very aggressive disease. Um, it's a full associated with the blast that we often know. Um, and so notice already, I'm already thinking, okay, they're here for induction chemo. This all started about four months ago. Most recently, two days ago, he was transferred here. What are, what are the things that we'd be worried about? So now as we go into the second part of the case, I'm going to keep the summary on the left hand side of the page and I'm going to show you different things that are happening. Notice that I gave you just a few things here, but whenever I admit a patient, there's always so much going on. I just gave you the story, but now here's all this other stuff that you're going to need to know. Whenever a patient comes in, you need to know their past medical history. You need to know what other things do they have. You need to know the medications they were taking at home and the medications they're, you're going to be giving them while they're here in the hospital. You also should know their allergies as well as their family and social history. So let's get into that now. So this is what makes things overwhelming, but notice that this patient has a pretty extensive past medical history, right? They're an active smoker. They have a history of an NSTEMI, which is a non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. They've had two drug-eluting stents placed to the left, left circumflex and the ramus. They have COPD, which is probably well controlled because they're not on any own, uh, inhalers or home oxygen. They have type 2 diabetes, their A1C is 8%. They have CKD, 3A, they have hypertension, um, they were previously exposed to Agent Orange, they have PTSD, and then they take hydroxyzine because of anxiety maybe. So. That's just the past medical history. Now look at their medications. So clearly inpatient medications include all of these things, including levofloxacin because they're getting inpatient chemo. And so they're gonna probably end up being um, high risk for infection. They're getting acyclovir. They're starting the chemotherapy regimen, which is known um, as the induction regimen, seven plus three. Um, Prazosin, Zofran, Diphenhydramine, which is just Benadryl. Uh, that was given earlier this morning. 
Outpatient, they take losartan, metoprolol, metformin for their diabetes, statin, aspirin, prazosin, and hydroxyzine. You may not know what any of those meds mean, but again, notice that like already as a resident physician, you just have to kind of take all these things in. Um, these medications are going to be things that could be maybe confounding his mental status. These are his allergies, and he has past medical um, family history here, where his father had cirrhosis, mom had type 2 diabetes. Um, and so now, let's think about what's going on next. So you're taking care of this patient, and an RRT, a rapid response team, is called for altered mental status. So what do you do? So again, if you don't know what an RRT is, just go ahead and watch this video I've made about RRTs. A rapid response is, is usually called in the hospital when there's an acute change in the patient's mental status or um, any acute change that the nurses are worried about. Maybe they're hypotensive. So in this case, notice that the patient has an, um, an RRT called for altered mental status. So right away, the biggest thing I usually think about is like, how do I want to approach this? Um, I usually want to make sure I understand the patient's medical history, and I also want to make sure I know what's going on and know if there's any meds that were given earlier that might be contributing. Notice that he got Benadryl earlier, so maybe that's contributing. Benadryl has been known to be a sedating medication. The other thing I think about is, is this an infection? Could this be some sort of central process that we'd be worried about? And then things that can kill a patient fast are known as the A, B, C, airway, breathing, and circulation. So I wanna make sure, okay, yes, he's totally altered, but does that mean he's not protecting his airway? Is this someone who might need to get intubated? B is for, um, uh, airway um, breathing and so are they breathing okay um, if they're having increasing hypoxia or increasing worker breathing that would be concerning and the third thing is circulation do they have good pulses are we worried about septic shock hypovolemic shock um, are we worried about obstructive shock maybe they have a pe uh, notice here that the patient isn't on any anticoagulation. So that might be another thing to think about in the patient who has cancer, they're gonna be high risk. So this is kind of what you're thinking. So I, I, I tell you, whenever you approach something like this, always do the basics. How do they look? When you get to the bedside, this is a patient who's altered. How altered are they? Can they tell you where they are? Do they have no idea? Are they just totally uptunded? They're not talking to you? And the biggest thing to ask for right away is a brand new set of vitals. Vitals are called vitals because they are literally vital to patient care. They will tell you exactly what's going on. So how does this patient look? This patient looks somnolent. He's not arousing to speech. He's groaning. He's withdrawing to pain. But when asked if he's in pain, patient points to his chest. So that's concerning. Are we worried about a heart attack? Is that something that's going on? What are the vitals? Well, the patient's hypotensive, 82 over 51, heart rate's 108, temperature's 38, which means the patient probably has a fever, and he's saturating 92% up to two liters on oxygen from zero liters earlier. So already I'm saying he's hypotensive, so chances are I'd already be giving him some fluids because that's not a great pressure to have, uh, especially if the patient's on the floor. The temperature is 38 degrees, right? So that means that the patient is now febrile and they're probably undergoing um, the chemotherapy. So this is high risk neutropenic fever probably because they're gonna be um, likely immunosuppressed with the chemotherapy they're getting. So maybe we start some antibiotics and notice that they have a new oxygen requirement. So you probably are worried like, okay, what's causing that? Is this someone who could have a PE? Is that something we even wanna consider? Uh, because are we even able to scan them right now? So these are some of the things that are already going through my head. So now, what's going on? What are the next steps? I already walk you through my line of reasoning. I always worry about making sure we rule out the crazy things right away. So I'd give him some fluids. Um, the other thing is because they're altered, I would probably get a VBG, like an ISTAT VBG, to make sure that they're not acutely hypercarbic. Uh, because hypercarbia can be another reason why someone can be very somnolent. If I have time, I would consider like a CTPE and maybe a CT of the head. But if I don't have time, though, the fluids, antibiotics, as well as maybe getting an ISTAT VBG would be the earliest things I would think about to make sure that we are reversing anything acutely that's going on. Um, this guy definitely looks very sick because he's clearly hypotensive. He's not responding to commands. So now, now that I kind of think about this and I've already walked you through the differential diagnosis, I've also told you that I work on getting different types of labs. I think about radiology and I think about the interventions based on access. The reason why access is so important, and this is why I told you the patient has a pick, is because it kind of helps me make sure, like if we didn't have any IV access for this patient, we're really stuck. And we one of the first things that I would do is try to get IV access. But luckily this patient has a pick. And so once I've kind of stored out 
the acute things that I told you about. I think about the more intensive labs that we want to get. I then think about the imaging we would want to get and then the interventions that I told you about. The only thing I haven't told you in terms of labs is like once you actually are like have a time to breathe, try to get more extensive labs. So maybe you want to get blood cultures because you want to see if this patient's septic. From a radiology standpoint, I already told you about CTPE and a CT head. And then interventions, I already told you we should already be giving fluids, antibiotics, and considering like an ISTAT VBG and making sure that we at least continue to engage with the patient and make sure he's not acutely getting worse. So now we've kind of thought about all of these things. I'm going to show you some of the results and right away, believe it or not, the labs, the radiology is going to be killer. They, they kind of almost in a way clinch the diagnosis but it, or at the very least to give you more information to act on. So now you see the labs and you see, start seeing that the lactate um, is high. The K is 6.5, the sodium is about normal, the platelets are relatively low but similar to prior. Everything in parentheses, by the way, is what it was before. The A and C count is low, below 500, which now makes me concerned for neutropenia. And you'll see that um, I'm a little clearly worried that you know this patient's probably in some level of septic shock, but the more important thing that I'm worried about is this hyperkalemia. Whenever I see hyperkalemia in a patient getting chemotherapy, you always want to think about something known as tumor lysis syndrome because you started induction chemotherapy. The EKG shows peak T waves. So again, this is now clinically significant hyperkalemia. You get peak T waves, then you often get widening of the QRS, and then you get flattening of the P waves in, in hyperkalemia. So this is already something I'm pretty concerned about. Uh, the POCUS, which is point of care ultrasound, show, and this is something I have not talked about. I love point of care ultrasound. I do it all the time, and I'm sure I will get into this pretty extensively. Anytime I'm at an RRT, I take a look at the heart, the lungs, the, even the kidneys, and the liver. I often do a fast exam, focus assessment of sonography and trauma. Even though if the patient may not be in trauma, it's a very, very good tool to kind of get good information fast. And the chest x-ray, as expected, shows by basilar opacities. It could be pulmonary edema. It could also be an infection. We do, we're just not sure yet. Um, and I even gave you a CT head, which usually won't happen as quickly. CT heads take a while because you have to roll them down to the CT scanner and this patient doesn't seem as stable, but the CT head looks good. So now that I have all of this information, hyperkalemia right away, insulin, maybe even some Lasix because these opacities in the lungs, maybe they're, um, maybe they're pulmonary edema, but maybe it's an infection, but the Lasix would hit, hit the hyper K, which is both the uh, allowing you to excrete potassium and maybe address the opacities. The second thing I would do is the lactate shows me a lactate of 2.7. I oftentimes don't like giving fluids and Lasix at the same time, but in this case, because you have a lactate, the patient's hypotensive, I would still give them fluids for sure, at least 30 cc's per kg. And you wanna do that because you wanna cover for what's known as neutropenic fever. And the reason why this is important is because neutropenia increases the likelihood that you have a very significant infection that you may not otherwise get because neutrophils are very early actors in the inflammatory response to help you fight off infection. Um, and again, the troponin is high, but it's not as high as I would expect. I would probably trend this out. I'm not worried about ACS in this patient right now, especially because there's no ST changes. Chances are this troponin elevation is likely in the setting of whatever else is going on uh, with this patient. Likely a component of septic shock, but also some level of hyperkalemia. Maybe they're also just in widespread distributed shock because of TLS. But until I figure out if the distributed shock is from infection or purely from TLS, I don't think I would be that confident that I wouldn't start antibiotics. I would still start antibiotics, I would give some fluids, and I would urgently treat the hyperkalemia. So again, notice that I highlighted all the important things here. The potassium is high, the lactate's high, and I told you how I would manage it. Lactate, I would give a bit of fluids, Potassium, I would give some K-axalate to maybe help them poop it out. I would give them some Lasix, and I would definitely give them some M insulin to temporarily shift the potassium. The A and C count's quite low. You should be worried about neutropenic fever. You should definitely think about starting cefepime at the very least, if not maybe vancomycin. If you're worried about the fact that he has a pick, he's pretty high risk for... Um, staph infection because he has a line. So that's another thing to think about. And then the EKG clearly showing signs of hyperkalemia. So that's kind of, that was a lot, but notice how you kind of have to summarize all of this stuff very acutely. Um, the next few things that you should probably consider doing is that this patient may need ICU level of care. I already told you we started fluids. I told you we started cefepime. And then I also told you to reverse the hyperkalemia. What was the actual diagnosis in this case? Well, the way I wrote this, it was actually a case of tumor lysis syndrome leading to hyperkalemia and maybe widespread distributive shock, but I don't think you can necessarily rule out neutropenic fever. 
which this patient clearly had from another source. And so you should empirically treat for that as well. I hope this showed you guys just the way we like to think as doctors. It's a fascinating field. Um, and as I told you, you have to combine a lot of the stuff that you already know with a very sick patient and then use that to guide your best judgment and point of care. I hope this was helpful. If you liked it, please drop a like, comment, share, subscribe. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.